thank you all for coming all the way to uh, Switzerland to participate in this event, and for those of you joining online as well. Uh, it's time to start the last presentation of the day, which is a talk on Haskell Language Server by Zubin. Zubin discovered Haskell while he was in high school. He was looking for a better way to write programs after getting frustrated with Python and Java. He studied mathematics and computer science as an undergrad and did a master's in computer science from Chennai Mathematical Institute. Um, while he was there, he developed an institute in compilers, program analysis, software verification, computer theory proving, type systems, and everything else that we all love so dearly. Um, he's worked on GHC for a long time now. He started working on Haskell IDE Engine as a Summer of Code participant back in 2017. So all of you who are students here, I, it's too late to apply for Summer of Haskell this year, but I highly recommend that as a way to get involved with things next year. Um, and he's been working on GHC IDE and Haskell Language Server. Um, so I'd like you to, to give a big hand to Zubin and listen. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about Haskell Language Server, which is an implementation of uh, the lang a language server protocol for Haskell. And it gives you type errors and go to definition and types on hover and refactorings and all the good things that you want from a modern editor. And it's the thing that sits in the background talking to your editor so that your editor doesn't need to know anything about Haskell. It can just talk to a program which is Haskell language server and it can get, it can uh, provide you all these features which you love. So uh, I'm gonna get started by talking about how HLS is set up and the basic moving parts that go into it. First, we have HIE BIOS, which is responsible for setting up the GHC session and figuring out, figuring out what flags do we actually need to uh, build your project with GHC. So this, this interacts with Cabal, Stack, Hadron, if you're working on GHC, and you can also plug into it and make it work with any build tool that you might be using. You just need to uh, give it away to get the flags that you need to pass to GHC, and it'll it provides an interface for that, and it'll pro HLS can use that to compile your project. Next, we use the GHC API, so we're not an independent compiler. We use the GHC API to type check your code, to get all the information that GHC computes about it, and to uh, basically do everything with, uh, about, for your Haskell code. Uh, this means that we are pretty tight to like the version of GHC that you use to compile your project. So you need to compile HLS with the exact same version of GHC that you're using to compile your project normally. Otherwise, things just break. Uh, we also use a SQLite database to manage persistent state. We'll talk about that. We use the LSP library to provide our interface to the editor and so that we don't have to go and teach every editor about all the different features we have. We just use a common standardized protocol, which was created by Microsoft a few years ago. and. Uh, it's, it's not perfect, but it's good enough, and it get, gets us uh, a, lo a long way there, and it, it's much better than what we had previously. Uh, we use a build system, uh, so underlying HLS is, uh, so GHC ID is a package that forms the core functionality of HLS, like go to definition, compiling stuff, hover, reporting diagnostics, all this stuff. And underneath GHC ID sits this thing called HLS Graph, which is a build system, but it's a very strange build system in that it operates entirely in memory. It's inspired by Shake, and uh, it's the way we manage state and manage re rebuilds in HLS. And we also have facilities to be able to answer requests promptly, and we also want to be able to respond to uh, queries in the face of failure. So, while you're editing a program, the default state is that things don't compile, right? Because you're typing your program in. But you still want your IDE to be working and to help you finish your program. So it would be really sad if things just stopped working as soon as you had a parse error in your program or you had a mismatch parentheses. So we have a lot of facilities to manage these kinds of errors and still try to provide reasonably accurate information to the user. and. Uh, and we also feature an extensible plugin architecture. So we have, I think, 20-ish plugins that are all kind of independent and implement different features. And you can, it's quite easy to get started writing a plugin, and we'll see how you can do that in this talk. 
So this is uh, a basic overview of how things work in HLS. On the, uh, I guess, on the left hand side, you have the part that talks to the, to the, to the editor, which is the LSP part. On the right hand side, you have Shake. You, this is not Shake, this is now HLS Graph. This is an old uh, image, credits to Pepe Ebora because I don't have these SVG skills, but uh, this should be HLS Graph, but the rest of it is basically accurate. Uh, this part talks to GHC, GHC and is responsible for uh, building your project, computing stuff about it. And that part talks to the editor and it's responsible for communicating with the user and sending requests and answering requests and all that kind of stuff. And in the middle, we have a bunch of things that live on disk, which are used to uh, uh, make load times faster and to ensure that we don't need to recompile everything every time you start up HLS. So we have your usual artifacts that you would see with GHC, which is .hi interface files. Sometimes you have .o files, depending on the features you use. Uh, Usually we don't, we, we try to avoid having them. And we also have HIE files, which are, uh, uh, fi uh, which are uh, files written by GHC to aid IDEs like HLS. And we also have HIE DB, which is responsible for curating and maintaining an index of these files. And it's used for persisting a bunch of information about uh, references and exports and so on. So that's the basic architecture of HLS. On the right, uh, on the left, sorry, you have everything that talks to, uh, you have everything that talks to the editor. So everything goes to there. Things start over there, they query this side, and this side might consult the disk and eventually give you back your results. So that's how things work. So what does a plugin look like? So to write a plugin, you have to fill in this data structure, uh, which is, which which is, looks kind of big, but it's actually really simple. This has, you, you start with an empty one, there's an empty plugin, and you have to fill in a few fields. You have to fill in the ID, which is just a descriptive name for your plugin. It's a string. You have a priority, we'll get to what that is. It's just a number, but it controls the order in which uh, plugins are executed. Uh, you have rules, which uh, is the hook into the build system. So if you want to define new kinds of state or new kinds of build rules that will be, that can also depend on other build rules defined by other plugins or defined by the core part of uh, HLS. So that will go in this thing, plugin rules. Plugin commands, I'll skip right now, it's an LSP specific thing, but it's not very important. Uh, then we get to plugin handlers and plugin notification handlers, which are the two core hooks that you have that your plugin will usually define. And what these we'll see is these things are the things you fill in to uh, get control flow into your plugin, depending on what the user is doing, or if you want if you want your plugin to get triggered on hover or on startup or when things are th when a file is changed or whatever. These two things are what you would uh, add your uh, what you would populate. I'm sorry, maybe it's not that relevant, but is there a system to which fields have a strictness annotation and which don't? Uh, not really. I don't think strictness matters in this because it's all static data and uh, it, it doesn't really matter in this case. <laughs> okay. That's just, okay. It's just historical artifacts. And Do you know what the reason is uh, you moved from Shake to HLS Graph? Uh, yes, I'll be discussing that. Oh, okay, great. So we also have, uh, you can, your plugin can also provide some, some, some of its own configuration so that uh, you can have configuration in the editor for your specific plugin. That's what this plugin config descriptor thing does. Uh, and you might also want to modify build flags or insert your own GHC plugins, not HLS plugins into, into the build or change how things are set up depending on your plugin. If your plugin requires a special GHC flag, like F strictness or something, then you can do that in there. Uh, plugin CLI is used for uh, extending the command line interface, but we can we'll mostly be ignoring that. And plugin file type gives you the file, uh, lets you declare 
okay, I want to handle Haskell source files and say Cabal files. Or if you're only working on the Cabal portion, you can say, I just want to handle Cabal files. And then your plugin won't be called for anything else. So that's what the plugin file type thing is. So, so how things go is usually, uh, so we start an HLS session, the editor communicates with HLS and there's, they have some back and forth about initializing, initializing things and where your project is located and which files are open. Uh, and after this happens, that's, we start getting requests like, uh, uh, like files have been opened or the user's hovering over things or the user's typing things or the user is asking for the definition of a particular symbol and so on. So plugins will, control flow into your plugin starts when we get a request or a notification from uh, the editor. And the, so there are two types of messages that we usually deal with, requests and notifications. First is a request, and a request has a response and it can be canceled at any time. So you have to be careful that your, your code is exception safe and you shouldn't block because at any, point you might uh, when 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 the editor cancels a request like if you if if you uh, if there's a completion request and the user types a character the editor will cancel the previous completion request and send you a new one so you have to be uh, you have to be fast generally and you have to ensure that your code is is exception safe you don't want to crash everything or put things into an inconsistent state and you also shouldn't in uninterrupt uninterruptibly block. So you have to be uh, judicious with your use of mask and so on. So that's important. And uh, multiple plugins can respond to the same request and all of these responses are combined in the end. So uh, that's, that's what requests are. And a notification is basically the client updating us about the state of the world, saying, oh, I've opened this file or this file has changed or something has happened or uh, that something in the workspace has changed or uh, it's basically the client telling us something changed and deal with it. And these don't have responses and notification handlers cannot be cancelled. So you can be a bit more relaxed about what you do here and the called in the order of plugin priority. And uh, uh, so we can, so this is where things usually uh, we trigger builds and we, we whenever you get diagnostics that are updated, those are due to a notification and then eventually we send, the, uh, once we finish compiling your project, we say, oh, your your program had these three warnings and then we, we send uh, another notification to the editor. So notifications can be sent, both requests and notifications can go both ways. So you can have notifications from the client to the editor, to the client to the server and server to the client. The client here is the editor and the server is Haskell language server. So requests and notifications go both ways, but usually there are different kinds of requests and different kinds of notifications. A request that goes from the client to the server usually doesn't go from the server to the client or and vice versa. So the different kinds of requests and different kinds of notifications. So this is how you define these two plugin handlers that I pointed out in the previous, in two slides previously. So you have make plugin handler and that takes a plugin request method. This is a singleton and it chooses which method you're gonna handle. Uh, no, sorry, that's that's the class. It's, it's S client method, which is a singleton. And you also, and you provided a handler. What is a handler? Uh, it takes the IDE state, so you can access the IDE features. It takes the plugin ID of your current plugin, which is useful in some cases, but you can mostly ignore it. It takes the parameters of the request, so whatever data the client has sent you. So that depends on M, which is the method. So if, you, if you're handling hover, you'll get a hover request, which has a position in it, saying the user hovered over here. If you're handling, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, look up symbol, uh, uh, document symbol or something, you'll get a string saying the user wants this, sim this symbol or so on. Or uh, So that is message params. So it depends on M. So it's, it's dependently typed in that way. And uh, you, you respond with something living in the LSP monad, which, which is the monad we use for LSP. 
and you would respond with either an error or a result of the correct type, again, dependent on M. So that's notification, that's request, sorry, and notifications are a bit simpler. You don't, you, you, you get, you have the same kind of structure where you get the IDE state. You get a virtual file system because uh, the things, the state of things on disk is not what you want to be working off of. You want to be working off uh, whatever the user has typed into their editor and that's all captured in this VFS. And the VFS is only updated on notifications. You get a new copy of the VFS whenever there's a notification. So that's the only time the VFS might be updated. Again, you get your plugin ID and you get your parameters. And this time you don't have to respond with any particular thing, you just respond with unit. And these things can be combined with uh, mapend or semi-group operations. So we can take a look at how this goes. So I've, I've just set up the basic scaffolding. I've set up, a, I've linked this plugin into the main executable and that's all I've done basically. So this is a default plugin descriptor. The plugin ID is set in uh, source slash something, but it's not here, it's, it comes from elsewhere, but it just basically, it says Zuri hack. I've got a plugin called ID plugin Zuri hack. And how do we go, uh, go about creating a plugin? You would say a plugin, say notification handler equals muck plugin notification handler and maybe okay let's let's handle the initialized notification so initialize is given to you after the initialization dance between the client and the server is done so basically when everything is ready for the first time so this is basically the first hook into hls that into uh, control flow that you get the earliest hook into control flow and we can see that what we need over here is uh, we, we need a function from IDE state, VFS, and blah, blah, blah. And over here, now we get maybe initialized params, which is the concrete uh, type pointed to that type family message params, which I showed earlier. So now, because we've specified, oh, the first parameter is now S initialized, the, the type of the uh, handler that we want to uh, create, it's, it's been specialized to this thing and we return uh, and we return unit. So let's do this. We can say, uh, we take uh, IDE state, plugin ID, oh sorry, VFS, plugin ID, and then, uh, do we need anything else? Yeah, and the parameters, and we're just gonna be ignoring them uh, right now because they aren't very useful. It just says that you've been initialized and we can start our usual, we, now we have control and uh, this is right after. So what we can do is we could send a notification back to the editor saying, oh, display this message to the user, please. So we can say send notification as window show message. It's no window show message, yep. And we can we can see what what this expects. So it just expects show message params. So we we, we provide that. Uh, and it has a type and a message. So the type could be uh, is basically is it a warning? Is it a log message? So we'll just say it's info. So empty info, and the message can be hello. Zuri hack, that's all. So uh, maybe if I should, I should try to close this. Does anyone know how, how I can close the right hand side pane? Control G, control B, right. So so it's, it's not too complicated. We just, maybe I should indent things better, but goes like this. Yeah, so that's our plugin for now. That's, let's try to compile it. And 
then I'll restart. And if everything goes right, we get a message saying, hello, Zuri hack over here. So it's, it's pretty straightforward to get started communicating with the editor and you can easily hook into any, yep, do you have a question? code to load uh, HLS, the HLS that you just built. Right. So I have a little shell script in my home directory, which points to the HLS in the location where Cabal will put it. And it has some flags that I like to use. And it also creates an event log because I use HLS for debugging and you know, it does all this stuff. But I have this script and I basically in the plugin preferences, I think somewhere uh, you can find it. It's, it's in the preferences. You can point it at your at a custom location for uh, your server. And I've basically pointed it to that script. So that's all it does. So uh, the server, the client communicates with the server over standard in and standard out. So they're just sending, it's just a regular binary and you're just sending messages over standard in and standard out. And also standard error goes to this debug console here, which is very useful. No, not debug console, but output. So you can see there are some messages from HLS here, which come from standard error. So it's, it's quite simple to uh, interact with a language server. In like all reside in HLS a source, or there's like some way to dynamically load a plugin from outside. There's no way to dynamically load plugins uh, okay. right now. I mean, it could be theoretically possible, but you get into many questions of is the plugin and is the HLS binary really compatible, or will you get a sec fault five minutes down the line? So uh, we don't support it. If you want to, if you want. To, to have more, if you want to handle more things, you can you can extract this out to something, and then you can just combine different request handlers using mappend. That's that's all you need to do, and you, you can have and you can have bar equal something else. So you just use mappend or mconcat or whatever. It's a monad. So if you use um, if you let VS Code download HLS for you, yeah. then you're basically you're stuck with whatever plugins are official in the official release yep. version yep. of HLS, right? If you want to have your own plugins, you're gonna compile it yourself. Or or you have to then convince someone, someone to, to put it into the distributed yeah. HLS. Yeah, I mean yeah. <laughs> okay. So we we don't you know, we have a question there. The plugins aren't really a user configuration system that's more configuration for it's making HLS manageable, so it lets us split up the code and also easily disable things. Often plugins don't work on your versions of GHC or something, and then we can easily disable them and get a working HLS for a later GHC version. But it's not really for users to customize things, unless you want to build it yourself. No. It's more of a project management strategy than the user feature, facing feature. But you also have a namespace, so you can you can individually go and disable a plugin or configure a plugin. So that way it is user facing, but uh, yeah. it provides a way to organize stuff. Right. So we've seen this and we've seen this also. You can you can send a notification. So this is how do you handle notification requests coming from this client? And this is the other side of that. How do you uh, send notifications and requests to the client? So, yeah, we have a question. Um, what kinds of information might a client want to send back to a request from the server? Can you give some examples? Uh, so client requests are quite limited. So the requests that you would send the client are quite limited. You can have a request to, so instead of this show message uh, notification that I send, I could have sent a show message request and that would have some buttons over there. So if I restart it again, you might see an example of something that I've uh, added to HLS, which is this thing. So it has, it has, it sends a message saying, take snapshot, yes or no. And 
this this is so when I click on no, that's sent back to the server and the server can choose to handle it however it wishes. This is one example of a request that's sent from server to the client, but there are I think limited examples of these. You can look have a look at the LSP specification to find more, but I don't think there are many of such requests. Uh, it's usually the client which is requesting the server to do stuff. Uh, we have a question there. I mean, I just wanted to build on that, mentioning that you know you 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 can send custom messages. So, say you've come up with some clever script running system, right, or test runner, um, you can request that the client show something or change something, and then handle that on their side. So, this is all sort of baked in to to give a reasonable level of flexibility that someone could in the future implement something more interesting on top of it. Yeah, you can have custom requests and notifications. It can go either way, but you need to teach your client how to handle them, and you need to teach a server how to handle them. So, uh, yeah. So we've seen this, and so the other part of HLS, which is the right hand side of the picture that I showed, it's it's the build system part. So we have to manage a lot of state, lots of files, lots of modules, lots of different types of results, lots of plugins which have their own intermediate state. So, uh, and things keep changing. The user edits files, thing or auto-generated files are written and read, and uh, things are in a constant state of flux. So some, these changes invalidate some of the state, not the others. So how do you keep track of which state is actually up to date, which is not? You use a build system. So uh, you also have state updates that are interrupted. So uh, we're compiling something, suddenly the user types a character, and then we cancel everything because every, the file has been invalidated. So there's a new file. So we, there's no point in doing the previous compile anymore. So state updates are frequently interrupted and left in this half finished state. So you want to be inc as incremental as possible. So you can build on the work that was done previously. Uh, and you, you also want early cutoff, which means that uh, something changed and now you recomputed stuff, but what you recomputed turned out to be the same as what you had before. So not, not much really changed. You don't want to go Recompute stuff that depends on the thing you just recomputed because that thing is the same. So we, that's that's early cutoff. So that's part of that's all part of a build system, and that's all part of Shake. That was all part of Shake. Uh, we initially did use Shake to uh, as a backend for HLS, uh, but we stopped using Shake. I think last year uh, or a year or two ago. Uh, and that had a few reasons. So now Shake is uh, Shake is designed to deal with disk artifacts and files on disk and rules that produce build objects on disk. And uh, it has a lot of overhead due to that. Uh, and while in HLS we do most of our building in memory, there are things on disk, but most of the things that most of the build rules that we're running they only operate in in memory. So uh, that's one reason. And we also have different constraints, uh, different, uh, uh, we, uh, we can assume things that Shake cannot. Whenever sh Shake runs a build, it has to check everything for freshness because anything on the file system anyway could have changed, right? We do not need to do that. We, can, we are guaranteed by the specification to get notified of any changes to anything relevant. Or we, we, we can register handlers for these changes, which is another example of a request that we send to the client. We can say, I want to watch for changes in this folder. And the client will say, OK, and then we can we receive notifications for changes to that folder. So anytime anything changes, we know exactly what has changed. So it's never that we have to go through all of the things that we've computed and see if they're fresh. We know what has changed, and we can work backwards in some sense. Uh, we can start at what's changed, and then uh, recompute those, and then recompute the things that depend on the thing that changed, and so on. We bubble up until we have a, we've got everything up to date. So, 
that's why we don't use Shake. Uh, Shake cannot resume these things, so it's it's slower in some sense, and it's it, it has to be much more pessimistic than us. This is why we switched to a custom build system. The API is still very Shake inspired, so it it looks a lot like Shake because uh, we maintain compatibility. We don't want to change the API while we're replacing the build system, but uh, it's entirely custom and. Uh, yeah. So what does this actually look like? So this is how you would type check something in HLS. So you define a type for keys in your build system, which is this type check thing. And you define uh, this type family instance to say what the result of, uh, what the result of uh, computing that key would be. So you would say type check this file for me, please and you would get back a TC module result, which is a data structure defined somewhere in HLS, which has, which is basically like a GHC type check module, but with some other fields. So what does this rule look like? So you define a rule. Uh, this rules thing is what would go in the plugin rules field, which was shown earlier. And you define, so this, this recorder thing is for logging purposes. It's, uh, so we're gonna ignore that for now. And you define, and I've omitted some logging stuff here, but you say, I want, I, this is how you type check a file. So this is how you compute type check for a file. So first you, you uh, get the parse module for a file. So this use function also takes a key and a file, and it gives you the result of computing that rule on that file. So we say type check depends on parsing, obviously. So we have to parse the file first. So we parse the file and we also, set up a GHC session with all the right dependencies and all the right modules and uh, all, the, all, all the right things in the right places so that we can compile this file. This, this GHC session depths will involve parsing and type checking and maybe compiling all your dependencies as well. So this, this gives you information about all your dependencies. And now you have a parse module, you have your dependencies. So you call a function from the GHC API to type check your module. Uh, I know you've learned in the earlier days that there's a renamer phase to this as well, but that's a lie because from the view of a GHC API client, you can parse stuff and then you can type check the parse stuff, but you can't say, I just want to rename this stuff. And that has something to do with template Haskell splices and how renaming and type checking is actually interleaved. Uh, so yeah, we have a question here looks like this rule, this type check rule, is per file. Are there other rules which are not per file but per some different unit or is this yeah, so the only kind of rule so that you this have? Data structure, this data type check, you can have it be anything more complex. And there are rules without files, so you can use that. So you can put any data that you want in this data. This constructor is just unit right now, but you could add some some information that you want, you want a custom rule to know about some particular thing which is not a file, so you could add that in here. And then there are rules without files, so you can use that. And we also do this add usage dependencies thing which is uh, necessary for correctness because we want to recompute this type check thing whenever anything we depend on has changed. And what we depend on we can, so in template Haskell, you have this function called add dependent file, I think. And what that lets you do is in template Haskell, you can tell GHC, oh, I depend on this file that I'm parsing at compile time to produce my instances or produce my, uh, my persistent specification or my SQL tables or whatever. And you can do that in template Haskell. And when you do that, you, you, you want to say add dependent file this is the file I'm parsing. So that if you change that file, GHC will not just be like, oh, this is no, when you go to recompile stuff, GHC won't be just like, oh, this is no or because none of your Haskell source files have changed. It'll, it'll see that, oh, this depend file that you, uh, you said you depend on, well, that has changed. So now I need to recompile your module and rerun all the template Haskell and so on. So what we do here is, we look at the results of type checking and see, okay, what are the dependent files that were used as part of this type checking process? 
and then we add a dependency on them, which is just get modification time, which is a rule that changes whenever the file changes. Uh, we don't use the result of this rule, we just want this, this just exists so that type check will be recomputed whenever any of these files change. So um, that's, uh, that's an introduction to how rules in this build system look like and uh, how do you actually use things in this build system. You have, uh, sorry, you have this monad action, which is what everything in here runs in, sorry. Everything in here runs, is inside the action monad, which is what use is running in. And rule, or use takes a key, which can be any type, and a file path, which is, uh, you want to compute the rule on a particular file, and it gives you uh, an action returning a maybe result. And the result is, uh, is, uh, equal to this, is, is the left hand side of this type family here, rule result. So whenever you define a rule, you have to implement uh, this type family here. An ID rule also has NF data and some other show and eek and stuff that we also need for stuff. We have, a, no, we don't have. Uh, we also have this thing, use with stale, which looks almost exactly like use, but it gives you something called position mapping. And we'll see what that is very soon. In addition to this action stuff, which gives you a consistent snapshot into the state of stuff, you can also run things in this IDE action thing, which is, uh, it's, not, it's not the best name for it, but that's what we have. <laughs> Maybe someone might want to change it, but it does the same thing as use with stale use with stale fast, but things in IDE action, they don't have access to all of the compiler state, they can't trigger rebuilds and so on, and they are faster in some sense, we'll see. They don't, uh, we, we'll discuss that shortly. So this is, so use has a bunch of variants. It has use, use with an underscore, which fails, it doesn't return a maybe, it just returns a value, and if the rule fails, it'll throw an exception. So if you don't want to handle dealing with a bunch of non-things, you can use use with an underscore. There's uses, which lets you request a bunch of things at once. So you have a key and a bunch of files. So you can request a bunch of things, and it'll compute all of them in parallel. Uh, and you have the underscore version of uses. And this will always guarantee that your results are up to date, or it'll give you a failure in the case of nothing, or an exception. And uh, they block, so it'll wait for things to become up to date. You might get canceled, but if you do get a result, you'll get the, a consistent uh, result. And this can be slow, so we limit this to inside rule definition. We try to limit this to inside rule definitions. So if you're defining your own rule, you probably want to use use. Uh, but and you want to use it for things that where correctness is critical. So if you want, if you're doing a big refactoring, touching all of the users' code, you want to be sure that you're doing stuff. You're doing the refactoring with the latest correct view of the code. You don't want to be doing the refactoring based on what code the user had five minutes ago, and then you just don't, don't want to mangle all of the users' code. So, uh, and also if you use if you use this fun these functions multiple times in the same action, you'll get a consistent view of the state. That's what we guarantee. So they'll all be compatible with each other. What is this use with stale thing? It gives you this position mapping thing. And what this, so in case a rule fails, use with stale will give you the, the result, if any, that we had computed for the rule previously. So if your file does not type check, you can still get the type checked information for the previous, the latest version of the file that did type check. And we also give you this position mapping thing, which lets you map between positions in the uh, version of the file that you have and the version of the file for which the rule was computed. So uh, I'll switch back to my editor, to, to OBS code. So 
I can hover over this and I can see this is S window show message or I can see the type of send notification. Uh, and if I just insert garbage in here, lot of garbage, let's make sure it really doesn't parse. That is an open parenthesis. So now this thing doesn't type check and it didn't type check at any point since I uh, started inserting garbage. But if I go and hover over this thing, I still get the type and I get accurate information and then I can, I can still do, uh, I can still do go to definition and all those things. More, many ID features will still work at this point. So even though we've just inserted a bunch of garbage in the file and we don't get anything for these things over here. So how does that work? We have the previous, previous version of the file. So we say we get a hover request for this position over here, which is on line 32. And we use the position mapping to map it back to what it was previously, which was like, line, I'll delete whatever I, I, I inserted here. So it was initially line 29. So the position mapping lets us map between line 32 and line 29 and says, this position in the new version of the file was actually that version, that position in the old version of the file. So that's what this position mapping stuff does. And you can go back and forth because if you compute a location in the old version of the file, you now want to map it to a new location when you send it to the editor, uh, right? So that's what this position mapping does. So you can do from position and to current, from current position and to current position. These are the functions that go both ways. And sometimes maybe you delete stuff and so you might get a nothing there if the position has been deleted or it didn't, or if it's new text that didn't exist previously. So these functions used with stale and this entire family, they will also block. So there's a whole family again with underscores and plurals, but uh, they follow the same pattern we saw before. And if the rule fails, you get an old result. That's the only difference. And they give you a position mapping. And you can use this for responding to requests even in the face of failure. Uh, now we get to use with sale first. It looks almost the same as uh, use with stale, but it runs an IDE action and not, uh, not action. And this function never blocks. So it just gives you the most recently computed thing. It'll, it'll queue a refresh, but that'll happen either asynchronously. So if you request a rule, it'll, it'll eventually update it in the background, but it'll never block. So this is meant for things where you want to give the user immediate feedback, like completions or, uh, or uh, where, where you have a very short window, or even hover, uh, or go to definition. These things all use use with sale first because correctness is not entirely crit critical. We'd rather just give the user a response and be, and be correct in 99% of the cases than just hang for three minutes waiting for things to recompile. Uh, so, so this is what you use when you just want to give the user request and you don't, it's not extremely critical that we be 100% correct. Uh, so, and if you use multiple of these in a sequence, uh, you might have an inconsistent uh, view of the state because they all get things at different points in time and these all, all these different results may be from uh, different snapshots of what the IDE was doing. The question is, are the rules incremental granularity the same as the size of the action? I'm not sure what that means, but... Ernest, can you come with a Rules are incremental per, so like, this type check rule is one unit. So either it succeeds or it fails. So if it succeeds, it gets put in the database and then next time we call type check, if nothing's changed, we just use that value. But, uh, so, so individual actions, you can call run action at any point from, from, uh, from one of those plugin handlers, and that might, the result of that is not stored anywhere. So if you stash something in an IORF or a file somewhere, that's obviously not incremental, uh, but. Uh, 
Yes. Yeah, uh, so he I just clarified. He says, I guess my question is, how does HLS keep it incremental? So if this, this code part succeeds, then we store it in the database and we record, okay, this rule was computed with this result and it depended on these things. Uh, and that's, that's what we do, I think. There's not much involved there. We just put it into a map saying, oh, we computed this already and we don't need to change it anymore. As long as any of the dependencies, the pass module or these files don't change, then we don't need to change this. Thank you. Right. Uh, so, so sometimes you might want to define your own rules with different kinds of state that you want to keep track of that depend on other rules and you want your rule, your state to change when things change. So there are a few options for how you go about doing this, which is basically this rule body type here, which has four alternatives. And the first one is the simplest or the common case where you take your key, you take a file path, which you're computing the key on that file path. The rule, the rule is denoted by K, which is the key. And you produce a result. And what does the result have? It has a maybe byte string and it has an IDE result thing. This IDE result thing, it's, it's again a pair, it's a type synonym for a pair of diagnostics. So any diagnostics that you're, uh, if like in the case of type check, any type errors or uh, uh, rename errors even, those will get, go into the diagnostics and it'll produce a result, which is maybe, the, which is just if the rule succeeded and nothing if the rule failed. This result will be put into the database, into a map it will be used the next time the rule is called if nothing's changed. Uh, the other thing it returns is this maybe byte string. So you can either return a byte string or not, which is completely independent of whether the rule succeeded or not. Uh, but we should only have a string there if the rule succeeded. So it's not it's not entirely type safe. But this should this thing should only be just if the rule succeeded. But what it says is this is the hash of the thing that I computed. So this is used for early cutoff. So if your rule was recomputed and you produced a new result, but the hash of it was the same, then anything that depends on your rule, uh, that won't have to be recompiled. That won't necessarily be recompiled because the hash is the same. So this byte string is basically a hash saying, this is the hash of my result. And if this thing doesn't change, then you don't need to change. If this hash doesn't change, then you don't need to recompute anything that depends on me. That's all it says. We have rules without diagnostics, which is basically the same thing, but they don't produce these diagnostics. Uh, we also have rules with custom newness check, which is a bit more complicated. In certain scenarios, we find that, uh, suppose uh, you're using template Haskell and sometimes you might want to like uh, compile a file uh, and you end up with a compiled file and then at some point you remove template Haskell and that file doesn't need to be compiled anymore. So uh, do you go and recompute, re do you rebuild that file because it went from a state of needing to be simplified to not needing to be simplified? No, you already have the simplified version, might as well use it, right? That's what this lets you do. It lets you say, oh, these things aren't exactly the same, but the, the old result is still good. So we might, might as well use it. So that's what this new nest check lets you do. And you, you have a build as usual. And you also have rule with old value, which lets you access, this value is essentially a maybe. It also contains a text document version, but it's basically a maybe. And it lets you access the old value of your rule. And this is used for, uh, for example, in recompilation checking. If you have the old mod IFS, you can ask GHC, do I need to recompile this mod IFS or is it good? There's a function called check old iface in GHC that does all the recompilation checking and says, oh, none of your dependencies have changed. You can just use the mod iface as it, as it was. Or none of the thing, it, it's quite a fine grained recompilation check that GHC does. So we want to take advantage of that. So for things where it's useful to have the old value around, that's what you use rule with old value for. And you define these by, uh, by basically this recording th recorder thing is again for logging purposes. Uh, 
and you give it, you use this define early cutoff. Again, the name is not accurate, is, is not the best because early cutoff is just one aspect of these things, but uh, that's how you define a rule. And sometimes you might, it might be too hard to compute a hash of the result you, 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 you have. So you can just omit the byte string in those cases and then you won't have early cutoff and this is bad for, for, for performance reasons because uh, anytime you change, everything you depend on, every time you're recomputed, sorry, not, not that you change, if your current rule is recomputed, then everything that depends on you will also have to be recomputed. So that's what happens if you leave out this byte string. Uh, but uh, yeah, so this is how you define a rule. You give it a body, and which is basically the function that you use to compute the rule, and you get a rule back. And this rule, you, you stick it into plugin rules, which is from the second slide I showed you. So any questions about how you might any of these things? No? Right. So let's proceed to, so this is, this is the build system part of Shake being, of, of HLS being over. We, we're not going to be discussing that much anymore. This is, so we've discussed how, uh, how you can interact with LSP and how you can interact with the build system. And we have a bunch of different types of build rules that you can look in the source and see, okay, these things might be useful for the thing I'm going to do. But, and you can use the functions that I've shown you so far to, to basically get much of the way there to write a plugin. And now I'm going to be discussing particular details about how HLS maintains this internal state, indexing, references, uh, some parts of the GHC API that we use, and so on. So that's what the rest of this is going to be. So we want restarts to be fast. And we don't want to recompute everything on restart. So some build artifacts we store in this folder. It's different on Windows. It's xdb config path. I forget. But you, on Linux, it's usually home slash dot cache slash jetcid. And you see a bunch of things there. And if you ever run into problems where the mysterious errors, uh, deleting this folder might help. Uh, so. That's, so this contains JetC build artifacts. It's, it, it's version per project and we compute a hash for each set of build flags. So we try to keep build artifacts or different things entirely separate. Uh, that's where they go. And this has HI files, HIE files, .o files if we need them. And uh, we use this to, rely, to, to make use of JetC's recompilation versions. So when you start up an editor, we don't have to go and recompile everything from scratch. We can try to use the things that are in the cache and uh, just uh, have you up and running quickly. Uh, some information, uh, some additional information that we need to store, like references, because we don't store raw ASTs for everything, right? Uh, those things that are not in interface files, they go in a, in a SQLite database called HIEDB. It's managed by a library called HIEDB. And uh, it has a bunch of tables for things that we generally find useful in GHCID. It's also a standalone program that you can use to get some IDE-like features, like references and types at point and definitions and so on. So it's, it's a very lightweight feature. And you can use it to index a bunch of HIE files and you can use it to answer simple queries. And it has, it has grown more tables than you can get from HIE files now because we use it in GHC IDE and SQLite turns out to be a really convenient way of stashing data and querying it. And we get all these atomicity and blah, blah, blah guarantees. So uh, uh, we've, we use that quite a bit. Uh, and we can also, yeah, and we we can use that to answer queries that are functions in HLS where you can uh, sub, you can uh, write to the database or read from the database, and uh, we try to ensure it's done up it's up to date. But this is all done asynchronously. So if you look for references requests or things that go through HIEDB, 
they might not be 100% accurate all the time, especially if you've just finished typing, but uh, it's, it's, it's done asynchronously. Uh, and uh, yeah, we also support a large variety of, a large number of GHC versions, all the way from 8.10 up to 9.6. And HLS must be compiled with, as I said, the exact same version of GHC that you're using to compile your project. So it turns out that we have a lot of CPP in our code base, which is not ideal, but it, that's what life is. Uh, we try to quarantine all of it this module in GHC ID. So if you're writing a plugin, please try to put in this module. But sometimes that is not ideal because sometimes when there are big differences in logic across GHC versions, you're gonna have it inline rather than have it call some symbol which does wildly different things on different GHC versions. So if there are major logic changes between versions, you wanna have it inline. So otherwise try to, if, if it's broadly the same across GHC versions, it's just the argue, order of arguments has changed or something else, then try to keep it in this module. Uh, there's a whole family of modules, compared.star, uh, right. We also use GHC exact print, which I'm not really gonna be talking about, but this is what we use to compute edits and you might wanna read up on it. And it is a bit, annoying because, so the new GHC exact print API is much improved and it has all the things you need. So GHC exact print lets you print out source exactly as how the user wrote it. That's the whole point. It has annotations for how many spaces there are and where the comments are and where the bracket starts and the bracket ends and all of these little details, the AST that, that compiler developers don't really care about. You just wanna parse it and throw, throw that information away. All of that is stashed inside the AST by means of exact print annotations. I think Simon mentioned gen located anno, there's an anno type there, which is where all these annotations go. It was done in a different way earlier to 9.2. All these annotations lived outside of the AST. So uh, that was a different in API and uh, we have a lot of CPP to support both of these different ways of doing things. And hopefully once we can drop everything before 9.2, we can get rid of that. But uh, maybe, maybe if you try to write new features, just use the new API and say old compiler versions aren't supported anymore. But if you're writing new features, I think that's acceptable. But uh, if it's easy to just have support for both versions, for all versions, then might as well do it. Ryan has a question. It sounds like there is a substantial amount of engineering effort required to update HLS to any new version. And I wonder, do you think that the GHC API could be changed in some way to make this process easier and less painful in the future? I think it could, but uh, we use such a large surface area of GHC. We use like basically everything, not everything, but like a lot of things, especially from the front end and things that you would never expect uh, from the GHC API we use in HLS. So I think it'll be quite a large surface area that we're gonna have to stabilize. And I don't think GHC developers will be too happy about that when they run into all these problems with uh, things breaking. But I think what might help is adding GHC IDE, which is the core part of this stuff, not all the plugins and everything, to head.hackage so that GHC developers can know, okay, I, I've made a change that breaks GHC ID, and maybe I should fix it, or maybe I should consider, reconsider what I'm doing here. Uh, so that might be a more productive way forward, I think, because the API surface that we use is like very large, so I don't think it's quite feasible to sit down and without a lot of effort to sit down and see, okay, this can be stabilized, this can't be stabilized, this, this is, you should not be using this at all, and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, yeah. Right. Now, finally, we get to some of the evil ways that we use the GHC API. And uh, this is, this is I'm adding this as inspiration for things that you might not think are possible or like uh, at a cursory glance, you might think, oh, I can't do this, but maybe you can use these features to 
uh, implement something that uh, implement what you want, even if it looks impossible at the beginning. So GHC provides these two types. These are from GHC, and it provides these two types, which is hooks and plugins. These two mechanisms to hook into various parts of the compiler, override things, and basically turn GHC into your own, uh, like do do your own thing with GHC. It's not it's not uh, comprehensive. There are parts of the compiler which you can't hook into, but it's it's quite expressive in the kinds of things you can do. So we'll be looking at a few of these fields that at different parts of HLS used in different ways. Uh, let's see. So the first one is type information for splices. So when we when we get it back a type checked AST from GHC, we get we have all the splices all expanded out. So if you have derived JSON foo in your source, what we'll get in HLS, we'll see instance to JSON foo where something, something, something. Uh, that's not great for us, right? Because you want to be able to hover over derived JSON, you want to be able to go to definition on that thing, you want to know what the original thing that the user wrote was, not just this thing. So how do you do that? So we have this run meta hook in JHC, which lets you intercept uh, intercept uh, things in the AST before they're compiled to code. And uh, we can install a hook like this to capture it. We right before type checking, we install this hook. We, uh, we run type checking. The hook will stash all of these things, which are basically the AST for this, like derived JSON foo. That AST for the original splice that the user wrote, that'll be stashed in an IORF. And when once type checking is over, we read it out of the IORF, and then we can inject it back into the AST and give you all the features that you want. Uh, so that's that's quite fun. Uh, then another feature that we have is this is a performance feature. We generate bytecode on demand and lazily, and usually when we're compiling. Uh, we don't want to uh, we don't want to de-sugar code or compile code unless we really have to because all we really care about is the front end. Sometimes you must de-sugar code in order to run the front end because the user is using template Haskell. So you actually need to run code while doing front end compilations. You want to you need to compile everything you depend on. Uh, so you have to de-sugar the code so as soon as you write hash language template Haskell uh, in, your, in, in your file, what that forces HLS to do is it forces HLS to go and de-sugar all the modules you've imported, which is not ideal, obviously, because earlier we weren't doing all this work and suddenly because of this little flag there, uh, this little pragma there, we, we, we have to do all this work, which, which, and you might not even have a splice in your file, but we still have to do it because uh, I'll, I'll, so in your import, you, you might import a hundred things in your Haskell module, but you might only use like three or four of them in a splice, right? Like for in, in this example, you might say have a billion imports in this file, but you're only using this little tiny derived JSON thing. So ideally you just de-sugar that the module that derived JSON comes from, right? You don't want to you don't want to compile anything else. But unfortunately, this is not quite possible because uh, to de-sugar something, you need to have its front end type checked AST, right? Whatever the result of the front end was. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that keeping these things in memory is quite expensive in terms of like mem heap size. So these we only keep type checked ASTs in memory for the files you have open in your editor. So we can provide all these features. For everything else, we, we don't keep the AST around. We, we just keep something called a mod iface, which is the interface file, which is like a summary of all the relevant things from a module that we need for compiling other modules that depend on this particular module. And mod ifaces are okay to keep because they're, they're designed to be kept like this, but ASTs are not, you don't want to keep around ASTs if you can avoid it. So we can't just 
we can't just the sugar thing we can't just look at a module and say oh it only uses these three things in in a splice uh so uh so we only need if a module only uses derived json in a splice we can't just say oh we should just compile whatever module derived json comes from uh, to by, to object code or byte code or de sugar it uh we can't do that because to figure out where this derived json comes from you have to rename the entire file and renaming the file requires that all your dependencies are already present so we need to have the dependency compiled ready to go so we need to have already compiled the dependency so we, at that point when you compiling the dependency you have to decide do we stop after the front end or do we continue with a uh, desugaring and compiling to co byte code or object code or whatever so unfortunately uh we will have to desugar everything that you depend on uh in a module with template haskell so but there is a little bit of work that we can avoid here so after desugaring there's a step which goes from your desugared expression which is a core expression to byte code which is what we use to evaluate template haskell you can also use object code but object code has its own problems with linking it's not very portable as linkers aren't the, the most stable pieces of software out there and they're not the fastest so we try to avoid linking when we can we just try to use byte code because uh your template haskell splices are probably not performance critical so uh, so we try to go through byte code there are some situations where we cannot but i think there are none in recent versions of gtc but uh we try to go to byte code but what we can do is we can avoid some wasted work when we uh when we see a splice we 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 know we have the the sugared code for everything that we might use in a particular splice but the we still need to do some work to get the byte code for the things that we actually need in the splice so we could go and compile everything to byte code everything we depend on uh this is not the best and we can actually avoid doing this what we do is we use hsc compile core hook which if i go back it has this type it takes Uh, environment the span which is the span of your splice and a core expression which this this runs after your meta hook so your meta hook takes your front end type checked ast uh, and it it uh, i'm not exactly uh, remembering what it returns but it deals with the front end stuff what hsc compile core hook does is it deals with the core of your splice so derived json foo this will be uh, translated into some core and that core will be passed to this compile hook uh hsc compile core expression hook and what it uh results in you can ignore the other other two values the tuple the first one is important it gives you a value that you can interpret as a haskell expression so this 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 for an h value if you're not running with the external interpreter you can just unsafe coerce it into a action that you can just execute you can just jump into this for an h value thing that's what that's how all your template haskell gets run you unsafe course this for an h value into a uh, haskell monadic action and then you execute that monadic action uh so this func this hook uh, it has a default implementation in the compiler it's responsible from going to core translating it into byte code loading everything that needs to be in scope for this byte code to be run so all your dependencies everything and it gives you uh something that you can run eventually so what we do here is uh we can hook into this and we can look at the core expression and see oh this core expression only uses derived json it doesn't use anything from all the other 100 modules that you have imported so what we can do is we can as the build system which is the hls build system give me the byte code for the module that derived json comes from and it'll go and do whatever computation it needs to do to compute the byte code for that particular module and then we inject it into the the environment at the splice and we by intercepting this we can avoid having to compile so many things to byte code we just compile the thing that we really need which is one module question 
that you want, don't want to keep the AST around because it's too big in memory, but now you have to keep the desugared code around, right? Yes, but we serialize it. So we serialize it to disk and we don't actually keep it in memory. Okay, and That's serializing the AST would be too burdensome. Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, that's unavoidable. So we do serialize the AST and we only, we, de we uh, decode it into bytecode on demand. And we, throw, we, never, we try never to keep the desugared AST in memory as well. But yeah, you, you will notice your memory increase or when you enable tempered Haskell, but I don't think that's uh, avoidable for now. Uh, and so we can analyze the core expression and we compute only the things that we need to compile into bytecode and we can then request the build system for those particular modules only and we save a lot of work by doing this. Uh, right. And this is, this is quite a big performance boost. I think we have a blog post in the Bell type blog about it. Uh, uh, so this ends up improving the performance of HLS and projects with a lot of tempered Haskell and also memory usage because uh, of reasons that I won't go into now. And something you can also do is you can also inject, now this is the th third thing, uh, you can also inject your own plugins, which is GHC plugins, which you might be familiar with. These are not HLS plugins. You can inject your own GHC plugins statically, so no dynamic linking involved because HLS is a GHC API pro program, so it can just, it's, it's basically a whole another implementation of GHC, so it can just add the plugin right there. So this uses static plugin fields, a field of the plugin data structure, and uh, it's used by, for example, Wingman. So what Wingman does is it adds its own syntax for doing tactic metaprogramming in Haskell. So it has all this special syntax, uh, you start a template Haskell code, you have to steal some existing syntax, so it steals quasi codes, but it lets you do tactic metaprogramming in quasi codes and gives you a bunch of stuff on Hubble. So this is something that you might might end up doing if LSP is not exactly, uh, it, it's the interface isn't sufficient for your needs and uh, you wanna, you want to do something, or you, you, there are lots of different kinds of plugins. You can basically inject any of them as part of an HLS plugin. So, uh, yeah, so that's just some inspiration for things that you might want to do. And I've reached the end of my slides, but we can go and look at some more HLS, or if you have any questions, uh, we can. So it seems to me if I open say I have a, a project I've been working on in VS Code and I have several different uh, files that are open and then I close it and later I open it again. Um, then I'll notice that um, I may be working on one file. It, it'll, it may take a second to for HLS to get oriented and load its cache files and stuff and the, the, little spinny thing yeah. <laughs> happens, but it's pretty quick. And then I, I start editing that file. And then sometime later I'll say, oh, I wanna edit this other file. Now I already have it open in my editor, but I haven't been touching it, you know? And I go to it and I start editing it and I try to hover and nothing's there and I have to wait for a few seconds and it's just got a spinny thing. So is it not yeah. preemptively, so uh, Processing all the files that so I so whenever you loaded. open a file in an editor, we get a request. We get a notification from VS Code saying this yeah. file was opened, and yeah. it doesn't really send those note. It so when you re when I if I restart this HLS, if I say restart, then it I think it only sends me did, did file open notification to uh. this file and all these other tabs that I have open, those have not been loaded. So. I can hover over here, but this file, HLS doesn't know about it uh, at all. Okay, so, so, so it's, it's VS Code's fault. It's, it's VS Code's fault, <laughs> I would say. Um, I also wonder, um, I mean, I'm pretty amazed by its ability to, to handle temporary errors. Are those, is that handled by some kind of special annotation? Uh, 
What do you mean by, do you mean the position mapping stuff that I talked about? Well, um, well, are, does, when you type that garbage in there, does that end up getting represented in your uh, No, so this thing, it is, no, it it is, just, assume we, we just, let's say I just, uh, VS Code makes it hard to do, but I just say there's an opening parenthesis there. Now this file doesn't parse at all. So we'd get no results from GHC out from okay, this. Okay, so it's still just remembering what happened before yeah, it, it just, parsed. Yeah, it just remembers what happened before. So if I, if yeah. I, I can okay. trick it, if I delete this, then insert it again, then I don't get, oh, do I? Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a little smart. Let's see, yeah. Right at this point, it's not parsing, but. Yeah, now, now it's broken, but. <laughs> yeah. Or if I get type errors, if, does the same thing happen with type errors? Uh, yeah, the same thing happens. For type errors, we will be able to parse the file, but we won't be able to type check it. So things that only depend on parsing, which is, for example, this thing here, uh, this outline thing here. As soon as this file parses, uh, that should get populated. Right. Yeah, you're missing Am I? Right. Yeah. So sometimes I've broken so, a file, maybe I've broken the type checking and it's gonna take me a while to fix it. And while I'm trying to fix it, I can't get any hover information and things like that. So I eventually will resort to going to the command line and building things on the command line, which is fine. But then sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, HLS will hang You'll say, oh, okay, my, my brain is stuck. I'm trying to process all of these changes that you made and it's not making any sense to me. And it's holding onto some lock. And when I try to build um, GH, uh, are build you it using, using GHC. Stack? Yes. Yes. So for yes, Cabal, using stack. we use a isolated build directory for HLS. So you might notice that even if you've run Cabal build, HLS might still be using Cabal build because it uses a whole new store or like a whole new disk new style. I forget what it's called, but it, it isolates that. For stack, that is currently not possible because uh, stack doesn't like it if you set the build directory to something outside the root of the project, well, Cabal is happy with it. So if we get that feature in stack where it just accepts build routes uh, which are outside the project, then stack should also work. Question. I think you could uh, work around that issue by just putting in the dot .git directory because you just don't look there and it doesn't get cloned. <laughs> no. I'm not sure if you want to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> good, a good idea. You showed us Wingman and something just came up to my mind. Um, is it possible with Haskell type checkers to implement some kind of Agda style case pl splitting for arguments instead of just trying to fit the holes with, for example, maybe or other function types? Wingman does have case splitting, but Wingman, Wingman does not work with GHC 9.2 or above. Uh, because oh, oh, thank the you very much. to upgrade it, I think, has fizzled out. So if someone wants to pick that up, I think that'll be great. Uh, great. Or maybe just get the more, imp more use features of Wingman, like case splitting and leave the tactic meta programming aside. If, if you can get that working, then that'll also be great, I think. This is a question from Ernest. Um, does HLS support a way to jump definition across projects if the projects are specified in a cabal.project file? Yes, but currently you're gonna have to open a file from both projects at least once. Uh, and at least once, assuming you don't clear your .cache slash GHCID folder. So if you do that, you should be able to do this. But uh, we are working on, I have actually a summer of Haskell student who's working on comprehensive support for this, which should work seamlessly, whether it's in project or out of project or whether you've opened the file or not, uh, we should be able to get this working seamlessly for all symbols from all projects. Uh, so, so. I have a student that's working on this. So way back you were talking about the different flavors of um, use, um, mm -hmm. use with previous result and use previous yeah. result fast or something. 
Um, and I was wondering what the consistency guarantees were for the previous result variant. If you, I don't know, There's change not it so much. the parser works just, and the type checker doesn't. You just get whatever was computed previously. It's like the most recent thing that was successfully computed. And Oops. you get a position mapping. So yep. the position mapping is guaranteed to give you the right positions between that version of the file and the new version of the file. But uh, there are no, like if you, if, if you use use with stale twice, you might get results for different versions of the file. Ah, thank so you. There's no strict consistency guarantees there, which it it it's not ideal. But I, I'm I fail to see how we can do better there. Maybe I should, if you're getting started with hacking on HLS, um, I should uh, I neglect it to cover what the major the, all the the files the folder structure of HLS looks like. So we have. HIE compat, which is compatibility libraries for HIE files, which you can mostly ignore. If HLS graph, which is the build system part, and you might, if that interests you, you might want to look at this. And it has, uh, it's fairly small. Uh, it has a bunch of uh, build system kind of stuff, but it's <coughs> fairly self-contained and fairly small. It, it implements something like the Shake API. That's that's HLS graph here. All the core functionality. Uh, go to definition and type checking and all so on. All of that lives inside uh, the GHC ID folder, which is this one. So we have a bunch of stuff here. Uh, you, you're going to want to import stuff from here to get started with the plugin. So you're going to import shake.hs, which has all the shake stuff. Uh, uh, that has all the uh, use functions would be, you know, not in types, but in uh, core shake, yes. So this has all the functions with uh, the define functions I wrote. So that's what you're going to import uh, for this. ID rule, ID state, a bunch of functions for managing the state. And uh, this has you define, I'll see. Define early cut off here. That's in this file. So GHC ID, unless you're working on core functionality, uh, like hover and go to definition and so on, uh, you don't really want to touch. Uh, then we have all the plugins. So plugins go inside the plugins directory, and we have all of these plugins. Uh, and for this talk, I added a new plugin, which is the Suri Hack plugin, which is this one that we were looking at. And if you're writing a new plugin, you're going to look in here. We have refactorings, all the refactorings and the code actions that you get, uh, which is this, uh, th these things here. Those those mostly live in the refactor plugin. And uh, if you're writing new features, you want to put in plugins usually. Uh, and if you're working on an existing plugin, that's also where you want to look. Uh, and we also have a main folder. So this is where you link in plugins. So we have a bunch, we have a bit of a dance we do with flags and CPP options for whether deciding whether you want to link in a particular plugin or not. So we have Cobol flags, which set a CPP option, which goes into this file. So to add the Zuri hack plugin, I added this bit of code over here. So I imported the Zuri hack module guarded by, again, HLS, no, this is not, okay, this is incorrect. I've made a typo here, it should be HLS Zuri hack. But you wanna link in the Zuri hack plugin if HLS Zuri hack is enabled, that's how you're gonna add a plugin. And uh, you provide a plugin ID over here and we have plugin IDs for all these plugins. Uh, they all live in this file here. Uh, it's in the root source I, HLS plugins. And they, these should get picked up by HLS if you want to add a plugin. And the other thing I did to add, this, add a new plugin was look at this file here. And I added uh, a Zuri hack flag. So that's this allows you to enable or disable the plugin using Cabal. And then I have a uh, Zuri hack section over here, which basically says depend on the Zuri hack plugin and set the CPP option which we were using. 
and you import it into the main ID stuff. So that's that's how you go about adding a plugin. It's it's a bit annoying to do, but shouldn't be too hard. And you can copy it off existing plugins. Right. Uh, I think that's it. Right. Thank you.